credit is the lifeblood of the global economy. And one of the best places to turn to, to see how this circulatory uh, system is working, is the Treasury International Report. You won't hear about it on Bloomberg or CNBC, but here on this show on Making Sense with Jeff Snyder, we do talk about it. Jeff, Recently, well, hey, I, I'm going to disagree with you, Emil, because you do hear about it on mainstream media, but usually for the wrong reasons, right? Whenever you hear tickets, oh, foreigners are dump, dumping treasuries. They hate the, they hate America. They hate Trump. They hate, you know, they hate something. They hate dollars. They're de-dollarizing. So usually, when you do hear about tick, it's always for the wrong reasons. And as we've stated before and we've shown before, when foreigners are selling treasuries, that's not a, that's not a bad sign for treasuries. That's a bad sign for everybody. That means dollar shortage. That means all the bad things. So when we look at Treasury International Capital, tick report, we're all, we, have to really, we have to realize and normalize it and, 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 and put it in a framework that it can be interpreted as the data is actually showing. And really, we've got to be careful here. And, and I, I, try to, I try to say this uh, as many times as I can. It is not a comprehensive view of what's going on in the global dollar system. Because there is no such thing. There is no comprehensive view. We only have the data that we have, which in this case, which we're, we're going to talk a little bit about, I think, the Treasury part of it. But mostly we're going to talk about cross-border bank activities, what U.S. banks are doing in relation to their foreign counterparts. And in this specific instance, we're going to be talking about what American banks are lending or claims on their foreign counterparts in various jurisdictions around the world. And that's another thing. And that's, that's one of the really good things about TIC is that, you know, we think of a Euro dollar system as a monolithic system, that it's, it's a global system. Therefore, it's the same in the European part or the, the Asian part as it is in every other part. When it, that's not always true. There can be some things happening in one part that aren't happening in another part. And maybe that's just a difference in timing, but we really have to realize that it's a, because it's a global system, there are definitely regional pockets and regional considerations we have to take into account too. I have just pulled up a graph from an article called Redistributing a Shrinking Pie is Nothing Like a Flood Because There Was No Flood. It was posted on November 18th at Alhambra Investments. And the graph I pulled up is the one that you brought out to our attention right away, the one that does make it into the mainstream financial press which is official buying or selling of U.S. Treasury bonds and notes. This data here starts from 2014, Jeff, so it suggests, it seems to say, they're always selling. But if we pull this data back further, this graph back further, it would be completely different, though, wouldn't it? And I guess the good news is that we've seen very recently some buying again. Good. You're right. That's, and that's, again, it's the opposite. Everything's backwards. When, when foreign official, and official by official, we mean governments and mostly central banks. So when overseas central banks are selling their treasuries, it's because they're experiencing dollar shortage and they have to mobilize their foreign reserves, which are primarily in U.S. treasuries, especially in U.S. dollar domination. They have to sell them off to try to supply some dollars that the euro dollar market is not feeding into their local systems. So when we see official buy or official selling take place very heavily, what we expect is all that rising dollar um, treasury rally stuff to take place. Whereas when they're buying treasuries again, as they had been consistently, be, well, less consistently between 2009 and 2014, before, 2000, before 2008, they were almost always buying hand over fist because they were all accumulating reserves because the euro dollar system was throwing off dollar resources to every part of every corner of the globe. So this selling phenomenon is relatively recent because the dollar shortage has gotten particularly bad, especially across Asia and in the emerging market parts of the, of the system. But in the last couple of months, we've seen a little bit of that reverse and there's been some minor buying on net in uh, official, official purchases of U.S. treasuries. Well, let me put a fly in the ointment because the next graph down is of corporate securities. Right now, we're looking at what are U.S. Treasury bonds. The next one, we're going to look at corporate U.S. bonds. And what do we see there? Now we get into what the private side, the not central banks and not foreign government, but private, mostly financial uh, counterparties, finance, banks and non-banks are doing. And what they're doing, especially since December 2018, is more and more buying fewer corporate bonds. US, remember, these are U.S. dollar-denominated corporate bonds, 
And ever since the early part of this year, they've been really selling them. Uh, in fact, in July, they sold so many. It was, it was, it was such a record low that it was, it was, it was a, a reminder that though Jay Powell says, hey, I'm supporting the corporate bond market. There's absolutely nothing to worry about here. We're going to be buying bonds and ETFs and all sorts of other things. Foreigners are saying, well, okay, now you may be supporting the corporate bond market, but we, aren't, we don't believe you. The foreigners are selling corporate bonds at a rate we've never seen before, which suggests, number one, if, if they are still experiencing a dollar shortage, which we know that they are, they're selling their corporate bond holdings in order to meet them. And so that may explain why governments, foreign officials sector, have been able to buy a few treasuries over the last couple of months because private hands are selling their corporate bonds so heavily. There was news just today from the Wall Street Journal that corroborates the September data. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin declined to extend several emergency Fed lending programs, novel programs backing corporate credit and municipal borrowing markets, and lending to small and mid-sized businesses and nonprofits during the pandemic will end December 31st. The Fed signaled its disappointment in this decision. We'll see if it actually ends, though. But I want to keep going now, and because you said that's what we just discussed is amazing. Perhaps the audience didn't hear it. Selling at rates not seen before of U.S. corporate bonds. But you say there's something even more interesting, and that is happening in Japan. But to do that, we have to look through the lens of China. And to do that, we've got to look through the lens of the Caribbean and Europe. Before we get to that main part of the, the article, I'm going to ask you to define a couple of sentences, okay? Um, let me quote you here. Quote, for one thing, U.S. dollar bank liabilities continue to contract as overseas dollar swaps, which aren't so much overseas, are almost totally paid back. What does that mean, Jeff? Well, it's, if, um, it shows up as a U.S. dollar liability because American banks or you know, uh, U.S. subsidiaries of foreign parents that are located domiciled in the United States, they're the ones who are borrowing heavily of these quote-unquote overseas dollar swaps. So it shows up as a cross-border transaction. It shows up as U.S. banks claims on foreign counterparties because essentially those foreign counterparties are, are – are sending dollars back into the United States. And the point being is we don't want to see U.S. bank liabilities contracting, right? We want to see them expanding, signaling money creation, growth, reflation, recovery. Is right. that so right? As, right. As they're repaying these dollar swap balances, that reduces their bank liabilities. But it, it, we're also not seeing an increase in their liabilities. Again, these are cross-border liabilities. We're not seeing an increase in them for other reasons, which would be, hey, things are good. We believe Jay Powell. There's a flood of dollars. Whatever it is, whatever reflationary, uh, 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 um, whatever reflationary reason you might want to assign, we're not seeing banks expand their balance sheets in these cross-border relationships as you would expect if things were going back to normal, if we were going back into a reflationary period. Instead, in the third quarter, it was a pretty substantial decline in reported bank liabilities in these cross-border uh, U.S. dollar arrangements. Right. Okay. So because dollars still seem to be tight. That's what we're seeing there. Okay. Right. So let's again, make the point that this is not comprehensive. This doesn't, this isn't the, the total picture of the, uh, the entire euro dollar system. It's a proxy that we believe gives us a reasonable estimation of what must be going on in the rest of it. The parts that we can't see that don't ever show up on any data anywhere, even tick. So what we're, what we're assuming and we think reasonably assuming is that U.S. banks are, again, are still saying we're, we're not seeing anything good here. We're going to continue to pull back in our cross-border dollar activities, and we're reasonably assuming that that extends into other places as well, that, that are these shadow areas that we can't see. All right, so we have to – we want to talk about the land of the rising sun. We're going to do that through the lens of the Middle Kingdom, but to set the, the groundwork here, we want to talk about the pirates of the Caribbean and the cradle of Western civilization, Europe and the Caribbean. What are these loci of euro dollar creation and redistribution doing? I'm going to pull up some graphs. 
Yeah, what we're seeing in the other regions that aren't Japan, if that's where you want to, let's start with those. The major euro dollar regions, these offshore US dollar spaces are the Caribbean and Europe. Obviously, Europe makes sense because that's where the term euro dollar comes from. It comes from the continental dollar, which became European dollar because of this European dollar market that, that showed up in the 1950s. But euro dollar really means all these offshore places, including the Caribbean, but also some parts of Asia, not just Japan, but outside of Asia too. There's, there's a relatively robust US dollar market, euro dollar parts uh, in Singapore, Hong Kong, and other places as well. So in those three areas, what you see is that going back to 2008, obviously the system changed. Something happened. You know, your, the uh, global financial crisis, which was a global, global, the first global dollar shortage, or what we call Euro Dollar One, was not a one-off temporary event. There was a partial recovery up until around 2000, the middle of 2011, when we had a second global dollar shortage show up which was really the fatal blow to the entire system. Any idea of recovery after that point, because going back to Henry George, what these tokens are, are an impediment in the machinery of exchange for the global economy. And that's why we don't get recovery. But what the banking data shows us is that, you know, since 2011, we've had a couple of intermediate, uh, intermediate spasms as well. And since March, 2020, which was, you know, March, 2020, which was the big event, We've got these three regions at least retreating and retreating pretty heavily in, in, the, in kind of the same amount that they had early in 2018, which triggered you know, the emerging market crisis of 2018, as well as what became the rest of Euro dollar number four. So it's, it's the, these Europe, the Caribbean, non-Japan, Asia, the banks there are borrowing fewer dollars from their American counterparts since March of this year, which is the opposite of what you would expect to see if things were going in a reflationary direction. And it's even worse than you see on this graph because of some data issues and some things going on in the Caribbean with non-banks and CLOs, which we, won't, we don't have time to really get into here, other than the fact to note that, Emil, you're not, you, you really aren't going to a Baccarat game. You're actually a James Bond villain. You, you, the Cayman Islands is actually your lair. And so all this Caribbean trouble in CLOs is really directly responsible to you. You just... You just play a mild manner podcaster by day, but as you're as you're you're letting the mask slip here by because you're dressed for your night job, which is as a James Bond villain. But when you're we in? remove when we remove your James Bond villainy, what we see from the uh, when we remove the Caribbean non bank contri contri contributions to the system, what we see these things become more clear, especially the euro dollar no number four uh, hole, which has gotten much bigger since March. What about this graph that I'm showing here? Because what is the difference between graphs number two and three? I think number two included non-banks, and you say that's fine, but really the heart of it is banks. And that's yeah. why we're looking at the third one. Is that right here? Right. As we've said all along, the euro dollar system is a bank-centered system. And non-banks, let's, let's be clear, non-banks are things like mutual funds, money market funds, other financial vehicles, and they also include you know, these special investment vehicles that were supposed to have been uh, extinct or, or pushed into extinction after the first global financial crisis. But that's the reason why we have this CLO problem in the Cayman Islands is that the non-banks are much greater than uh, just, you know, money market funds or mutual funds. They're, they're financial entities that are not, you know, depository institutions. For, let's, let's put it that way. But so when we remove some of those non-banks and look at just the banking sector in those three regions, you kind of see how things have gone since the beginning of 2018. There is a big dollar hole and it has grown bigger this year. It hasn't been fixed by the Federal Reserve. All these promises to bail out whatever market, QE, massive expansion of bank reserves, all these things have not convinced the, these major region banking systems to, to uh, borrow dollars from their American counterparts that they had, as they had done in the pre-crisis era. And that's really, you know, the larger point here is that QE doesn't solve anything. QE didn't fix anything. It's a banking system that's broken. So for our audience that isn't watching this, but instead listening, the three graphs I would describe as showing the exponential escape velocity growth before 2008, peak, then a valley, a peak heading into 2011, then a long valley. And then depending on what you want to look at, we saw the start of another peak 
if you include the Caribbean and the CLO activity. But if you take that out as perhaps not representative of the whole system, we see a plateau if you include the non-bank activity, which is important. But then if you look at the real heart of it, the heart of it, just the banks, the Caribbean, Asia, Europe, official institutions, what we see is peak, valley, peak, and then just a unending dribbling lower and away. And I think that's, that very well explains what is happening in our global economy. But this is a story about Japan. And in graph four, you layer on Japan, Jeff. What do we yeah, see now? Yeah, one reason why, before you change the graphs, Emil, go back to the other one. You know, that big dip in early 2018, that was consistent with not just, you know, it wasn't just the, the regions we're showing here. The Japanese were a big part of that too. And so in the beginning stages of Euro dollar number four, it was completely, totally system-wide. Everybody was involved in getting the hell out of the dollar, these cross-border dollar, cross border dollar arrangements because they saw this coming, you know, this, you know, this was not a globally synchronized growth. This was not, you know, uh, inflationary acceleration off into the sunset of recovery at long last. It was quite the opposite. Things were going the wrong way early on in 2018. And what's interesting and what's important about Japan is that, yes, they participated the same way that everybody else did in 2018. But ever since around October of last year, Japanese banks have been borrowing hand over fist from their American counterparts in U.S. dollars in a way we haven't seen in many, many years. And so that kind of complicates the picture somewhat, especially since you realize what happened last October, last September, October, and add over top of that, you know, the Chinese yuan's exchange rate with the dollar, which has been suddenly rising after falling precipitously during this euro dollar number four bank, uh, bank uh, withdrawal. All of a sudden, Japanese are borrowing dollars from Americans, CNY is rising again. It leads us to believe that maybe there's a connection there, but, you know, what, what is that connection? Well, that, I guess, okay, hold on a minute. Wait a minute. You just introduced the, the CNY, the, Jap, the Chinese currency. And I guess that was the original point that you're trying to get to in this article is to explain why is the CNY rising when other emerging market currencies are not doing so well? And we saw something similar in 2018, except there was a difference back then with Japan. So is, do I understand it correctly? Have we explained to the audience that you think there's a connection with Japanese banks and the CNY? And how does it all to get, tie together? Yeah. And back when uh, 2017, when CNY was rising, what we didn't see were U.S. Treasuries piling up in the PBOC's hands or the safe hands, which, which, which would, would corroborate and indicate that there was a, a, a lot of dollars available and the Chinese were easily accessing the euro dollar funding markets. And that's what happens. These, uh, these euro dollar funding arrangements lead to dollars ending up in official hands, which then get converted into U.S. Treasuries, the PBOC buying treasuries and whatnot. So... We would expect that if CNY was rising, the U.S. dollar falling against the Chinese currency, that they would be buying treasuries because there's lots of dollars behind that CNY rise. But we didn't see that from around September 2017 forward. CNY kept going up, but yet there weren't the treasuries. In fact, the treasuries started to fall, which kind of suggested something else was going on. What that something else was, was it became euro dollar number four, this fourth global dollar shortage. But specifically with China, what we saw was Hong Kong banks suddenly started borrowing heavily from their American counterparts and then a bunch of stuff going on with a Hong Kong dollar, how it was exactly mirroring uh, inversely the Chinese yuan's relationship to the U.S. dollar. So it suggested that, okay, China was doing something specific through Hong Kong's banks that wasn't happening to the rest of the system. Except that, of course, that all, that all fell apart in April and May of 2018 when everybody got smacked by what was this next rising dollar episode. So if we're looking back at 2017 versus 2020, we see kind of the same things again, right? We see CNY extremely strong compared to everybody else. It's, it's even way outdone the euro on the upside, yet we don't see treasuries going back into the PBOC's hands or safe or anywhere else. In fact, just the opposite. The other part of tick that I showed in the, in the article was that uh, 
Chinese mainland holdings of treasuries have sunk to the lowest level in years. They continue to decline. So we're not seeing the uh, systemic signs of dollars going back into China that we would under reflation. So now we start to look for alternatives, what might be going on. And lo and behold, we now have this Japanese thing taking place. But it's not, it doesn't seem to be Japan as part of everybody else, you know, a, a widespread systemic reflationary event. It's just Japan when the rest of the world, the Caribbean, Europe, and the rest of Asia X Japan are saying, no, we're not doing this dollar stuff. And it's just CNY that's rising. It's not other emerging market currencies. They are up a little bit from where they were, obviously, at the crisis highs in March, but they're not surging ahead like CNY is. In fact, most of emerging market Asian currencies are still much lower than they were before the crisis began. So what we're seeing is specifically CNY strong, Japanese borrowing dollars from U.S. banks, and those are the only parts that are, that are doing these things. Everything else is still in the toilet. Everything else is still in dollar shortage, bad kinds, you know, rising dollar, all that deflationary stuff, except for Japan borrowing from U.S. banks and CNY strong in a very isolated case. So what we're, what we're, what we're thinking is that there has to be a connection there because, first of all, we saw it with Hong Kong, but second, because there's really not many other alternatives to explain this. And really, and I think I want to be clear about that, that, you know, what's happening between Japan, what's going on between Tokyo and Beijing, we don't really know. That's, that's really the mystery here. What specifically is taking place? What are Japanese banks doing? What we're saying is that there's something unusual in these two places. We think they're probably connected. And there's, it's, it may be, you know, and there's some other stuff going on too that we haven't, we don't have time to get into, but there are connections there that, that uh, pique our interest. I would love to get into it more on our next episode, Jeff. So hold back. Let's do a cliffhanger. That's what professional broadcasters do. I don't know what you would call this show, but let's pretend we are. Let's do a cliffhanger and let's talk about some of these things, what they might be as we look into the shadows next week. Yeah, and I think, you know, if, if any readers have their own theories, maybe that's something we should do. Let's solicit some, you know, uh, people who have been paying maybe closer attention to some of the details. Maybe they have ideas and can fill in, fill in some of our gaps here. Or maybe just refute our, and say, hey, you guys are crazy. You got it all wrong. I don't think so, but uh, maybe we do. And so, hey, let's, let's make this a collective project. Send all the complaints and the hate mail to at Emil Kalinowski on Twitter. Send ideas, suggestions, and helpful notes to at Jeff Snyder underscore AIP. And if you want to send Lou Doodles or anything like that, you can do on the YouTube channel. In the comments section, just search for Making Sense.